Welcome to another episode of BHP Book Club. I am your host, Kelly Morgan. Today I'm speaking with author Julia Sullivan as we discuss her book, Bone Necklace. Bone Necklace is about the Nez Perce uh, tribe and the War of 1877. Her book is wonderful. It's historical fiction, and I really like the way that she has written this book. I think you will enjoy it as well. So let's just get right to it. Welcome our newest book club member, author Julia Sullivan. Julia, thank you so much for being a member of the book club and coming on the podcast. Welcome. Thank you, Kelly. I'm so excited to hear about your book, Bone Necklace, and and how it came to being, um, because it seems like this was, this happened over time, right? And so I'm I'm so interested in the story. But before we get into the book, I'm interested in how an attorney, correct, decides to become a writer. Like, how did you decide that you were going to become a writer? Did you always know you wanted to be one, or is it something that just... It just happened one day. But I'm sorry for my clock booming in the background. Um, it, it, it was it was not intentional, at least at the beginning. Um, I was still very much practicing law full time when I um, went to visit the Big Hole Battlefield in Wisdom, Montana, which is where one of the bloodiest battles of the Nez Perce War was fought. And it's, um, it's just an amazing place. Um, it was a very moving experience and I got really interested in the story. And I, when I got back to Washington DC, I started researching um, about the tribe, about their history, about the conflict, how it started, how it ended. And, um, Pretty soon I had quite a library full of material and um, and I so I got the idea that I would try to write a book and I started and I stopped and I started and I stopped it took me over 20 years from that visit until today um, but uh, and I really didn't finish the book until I had pretty much retired from the practice of law um, so it was kind of a it was just sort of a natural um, thing for me to pick up this project that had been sort of an obsession of mine for many years and finally finish it. So so now that this book is out there and published, are you looking to write other books or is this a one and done situation? Well, I would definitely have to be more efficient about it. <laughs> I don't know if I could spend 20 years writing another one. I'm not sure I have that many productive years left. But um, yeah, I have to say I enjoyed this process so much um, that I'm almost sorry to finish because I've enjoyed working on it so much. And um, I, I've actually started a couple of others. I'm not sure which one I'll really focus on but yeah I have a couple of ideas that I um and one of them seems to have really obsessed me almost the way the Nez Perce story did so that's probably going to be the one but I'm not ready to talk about it yet so no. yeah I probably will write another book but um I'm really really hoping it doesn't take me 20 years again well we don't have to talk about it now no worries no worries we won't put you on the spot but I am curious as to um if you self-published or if you found a publisher for your book? I found a publisher, Brandy Lane Publishing, Inc., and they've been great. Um, I actually had a publishing contract with a different company. I wound up terminating that one, and um, I went with Brandy Lane, which was smaller, but they've been fantastic. They've been really fantastic. Yeah, that can make all the difference in the world. So tell me about the book, Bone Bone Necklace. Is it fiction or nonfiction? 
It's historical fiction. So it's, it's inspired by a true story of America's last so-called Indian War, in which a small band of Native American warriors held off four converging armies while their families escaped to Canada. Uh, one thing I didn't know until I started researching this book was that at the time, Canada was granting political asylum to Native Americans. Um, so the Nez Perce who were able to reach Canada uh, were able to live the rest of their lives there in peace. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's, it's a fascinating story. And one of the things that really, well, so many things about it really grabbed my attention, but I really loved the idea of a Native American story uh, from the 19th century that didn't end the way I expected it to. It didn't end with the tribe being defeated and destroyed. Um, it ended, uh, if not with victory, um, then certainly not in defeat. You know, they, uh, a good number of them escaped and preserved their culture and lived in peace and with freedom and dignity. Um, and I just thought, we need more stories like that. Yeah, I would agree. So it's historical fiction. So you you wrote it kind of after being inspired by this, this story. So tell me about your characters and how they relate to the actual events that happened. So the... Um... Uh, the, the challenge with writing historical fiction is, um, for me, I didn't want to tell this story as nonfiction because you couldn't really have dialogue, right? And you couldn't explore the, um, the internal thought processes of the characters. You couldn't get close to the characters um, because we just don't know we don't have that information factually. So um, Bone Necklace takes uh, the actual events of the war, the actual battles, uh, the timing of the battles, the, um, uh, the, the leaders for each side. Um, but it follows three fictional characters who sort of represent um, different factions. So there are three points of view in the book. Uh, one is a Native American warrior, um, and he sort of represents all the Native American warriors, right? I just, um, he experiences what um, anyone his age in that time and place would have experienced. Um, and then the second character is a militiaman from Idaho who sort of gets dragged into the war, which was fought partly by army regulars, but largely by uh, volunteers, militiamen. Um, so the second character is a militiaman fight, fighting on the side of the army. And the third character is um, an, a woman, an artist, whose husband is killed um, by the Nez Perce, and she is taken captive. And her character was inspired by um, the fact that there actually were two groups of tourists in Yellowstone Park who um, had brief encounters with the Nez Perce and uh, some of them were taken captive and later released and actually became advocates for the tribe after their release. Um, so I thought that was such an interesting part of the story that I have a third character who um, who represents that. She's, she's not based on any one the characters who was taken captive, but she sort of represents that experience. So obviously the story ends because we what we know in history, but do you talk about them after they made their way into Canada and maybe what their life was like? Briefly, very briefly. The um, One of the challenges with writing this book, um, I originally was going to tell the story from 185 when the Nez Perce met their first Americans, Lewis and Clark, until 1877 when the war occurred. And according to Nez Perce uh, culture, um, William Clark had a son with a Nez Perce woman who was actually captured at that final battle. Um, 
he would have been 71 years old by then. So I just thought that would be so amazing to sort of tell that whole story arc in one single lifetime, right? But um, I wound up just telling uh, the three months of the, or the four months of the war. Um, so uh, what happened before is kind of backstory. And, and I briefly talk about, um, you know, what happened after they reached Canada, but it's mostly about that four month conflict. Do you see yourself writing any other books around this particular topic? Because you've done so much research. I know, I'm really tempted to do a prequel. And that's what I was gonna ask you. Are you gonna talk, are you gonna do a prequel? Because I can see where you could. Yeah, I've, I might, I might. Um, and I've talked, I've thought about a sequel too. I've got it all worked out in my head, but you know, the difficulty I had with my longer time frame was that um, I was gonna sort of follow the life of this one man who was Clark's son and then he gets captured at the final battle. I thought that would be an amazing book, but of course at 71, he wasn't really in the action. <laughs> by the end of the war, right? Um, so I, I, then it had to become a multi-generational book and it became too complicated, so I didn't do it. But I did sort of think it could be divided up into a series. Um, I actually think it would be a great um, like mini series or something like that where you could touch on some of these earlier bits, you know, in an hour or something. And probably a lot of history that people aren't familiar with either, right? Yeah. That you could touch upon too. And that's probably, um, I like historical fiction. I like stories about real people, but you're right. If, because a lot of the dialogue, we don't know what, what they said to one another or anything. Right. I can see why you would take the route of historical fiction so you can fill in those blanks for us. Right, right. And simplify. There's another novelist who wrote about this war and his was historical fiction, um, but it uh, it hewed more closely to historical fact. So whereas, you know, I have um, I, I, I sort of follow one general who was, you know, involved in all the battles. This other novelist wanted to follow them all, mm. you know. And so there's so many characters um, that the novel ran to 1,700 pages, right? And it never and it and all of that was just from the army point of view. It wasn't, you know. And so that's the difficulty: is if you the closer you hew to the facts, the longer, and more detailed, and I almost think you lose the story. So do you know how many of the tribe escaped into Canada? Yes, they um, they started the war with about 800 people um, and they lost um, like 120, 130 during the war and uh, 400 surrendered and about 300 escaped to Canada. Um, so at the end of the, at the final battle, they, uh, they started out in Idaho and they ran a, a, a fighting retreat for 1100 miles through uh, Montana, Wyoming, Yellowstone Park, then back up to Montana. They were about 30 miles from the Canadian border when they had this final battle. And um, they were, uh, they were under siege. So the army had thrown a siege line all around their camp. And um, uh, they, they had two surviving chiefs. Um, one was uh, Chief Whitebird. And he took uh, two, between 290 and 300 uh, people out. In ones and twos, they slipped through the siege line. Um, through snow and ice, it was, you know, it was October, which in that part of the country is really cold. Um, so he slipped out to Canada. Um, he actually um, met up with Sitting Bull, who'd also been granted, the Lakota chief Sitting Bull, 
who had also been granted political asylum in Canada at the time. So um, Chief Sitting Bull took them in that winter um, and Canada gave them all political asylum. And um, Joseph, uh, who was uh, still physically strong, uh, stayed behind with the people who were not able to make that final journey. They just weren't physically strong enough to make that final journey. So he sent his wife and daughter to Canada with White Bird. He never saw them again. Um, and he stayed behind with um, those who just physically couldn't make it. Um, and he became quite famous. And when you read about the Nez Perce, you read his story and his story of surrender, which was quite heroic and self-sacrificing. Um, and uh, uh, I could talk about him forever, but the piece of the story that most people don't hear is about White Bird, who escaped, and the people who escaped. Um, even if you read the um, Department of the Department of War annual report for 1877, which is mostly about this war, um, at the end of that report, you would not know that over 40 percent of the tribe escaped. You would not know. Hmm. And now, now I'm so interested in what their life was like in Canada and what became of them. So you have to write the sequel <laughs> so we know yeah. what happened to them because now I'm curious. Now yeah. that you know that so many of them escaped into Canada and what what was life for them there and what and what was life for the ones that remained behind. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um... Well, at that final battle, Chief Joseph was told that if he surrendered, um, he and his people would be sent to a reservation in Idaho where they had relatives and that nobody would be prosecuted. And um, so he sort of stalled the negotiations for long enough for White Bird to get to Canada. Um, and surrendered uh, but instead of sending him to Idaho like promised uh, they sent the Nez Perce to a malarial swamp down in Kansas um, every Nez Perce child who was born there died uh, every 100% infant mortality rate um, eventually um, Joseph met with three different presidents um, he was extremely articulate and eloquent and uh, eventually the government agreed to send uh, the members of his tribe who agreed to become Christians to Idaho and the ones who wanted to keep their own religion would go to Nespel in Washington. Joseph went to Washington um, and that's where he died and is buried. So that's kind of the story of the ones who surrendered. Um, and then the ones who made it to Canada, I don't know, I might, I might write that book some, some days. Some of them actually joined Joseph when once he was in Washington, many of them decided to join him there, even though they had to live on a reservation. Um, and uh, uh, Whiteberg lived the rest of his life in Canada. He died there, uh, most of the rest. There's still a large Nez Perce diaspora in Canada as well as Kansas, as well as Idaho, Oregon, and Washington, because they all got split up. They all got split up. Absolutely yeah. fascinating history. Absolutely yeah. fascinating. I just love hearing about real people and real events. And I like the way that you made it fiction so that you could give us the dialogue and kind of, like I said before, yeah. fill in the gaps. I think that's yeah. wonderful. So yeah. one of the things that most authors, once they get their book out there and it's published, and that's a big sense of relief. And I know that you have a publisher, but what are you doing to market the book, Julia? You know, I'm, I'm glad you asked that, Kelly, because um, you could probably give me some advice. Maybe I'll start asking the questions. Um, you know, this is my first novel. Um, so the publishing industry is brand new to me. And uh, so, um, you know, the publisher does some 
some promotion, but their job primarily is distribution. They get it printed and they make it available for sale. Um, but it's really the author's job to do most of the marketing. And so first I had to figure that out. Um, and then I had to admit to myself that I did not know how to market a book because <laughs> I've never done it, right? So I hired um, I, I hired a publicist and okay. they've, been, um, they've been teaching me, you know, what, what they think I should do. And so one of the things they thought I should do was this podcast. Um, Podcasts are a great way. I think, and I tell this to everybody because I'm a big advocate. I think your book would sound wonderful as an audio book. And then you open yourself to a whole new audience of people that maybe love to read, but don't have the time, but they'll listen, right? Yeah, actually we, we did an audio book. Um, I, I didn't read it myself because most of the, most of the, um, the, I don't think I could convincingly portray a Native American warrior with my voice. You've heard my voice now. <laughs> so it is on, it is an audio book. It is an audio book, but I, um, I hired a um, Native American actor who has a beautiful baritone voice he did a great job so yeah i love audiobooks i listen to them all the time when i'm running or when i'm in the car or you know when i'm working out or walking that's the why dog. i say audiobooks are great because you open up a whole new audience and there's a lot you can do for marketing i think the trick is is how much time and effort and money are you willing to put into marketing now that some of the COVID restrictions are lifted, people are now trying to do book signings and things like that, where before everything was virtual. Yeah. You know, and you know, there's only, there's a lot of companies out there that say they market, but I think to truly market, I think you have to think out of the box and you have to think about how much time do you want to put in into the marketing and, and what is success for you? For right. some people, it's just selling one book. That's all they wanted. They just wanted it to be a book, right? Yeah. For yeah. some people, it's, you know, success is when they sell a million copies. So, well, you know, I just, it's, um, it's my first time doing this and I may do it again. I may not, but I wanted to do the whole thing. I wanted to do the whole thing from start to finish. I wanted, I wanted the paperback and the hardback and the audiobook, and I just wanted to do, you know, I just wanted to experience the whole thing. Yeah, and, and I get so, it. And I think yeah. you should. I think you should try to do some book signings. People yeah, love to meet the authors, right? And love to meet the authors. And I mean, and there's, I've had people say they've done many things where they've even gone to farmers markets. Oh, really? Yes. And That's sold their books there. And I thought, well, that was uh, interesting. They're like, yeah, why not? You know, so yeah, I mean, I you know, there's a lot of things that you could do, but I, I, your book sounds wonderful, Julia. I want to thank you for sharing, you know, what you shared with us about the book Bone Necklace. It's available on Amazon. Is it available anywhere else? It will be in March, 2022. Uh, it's not available yet, but I have a website, juliasullivanauthor.com, and all the links will be posted there when it's available in the spring. And, and, and the audiobook will be available in the spring as well? Mm -hmm. So everything mm -hmm. will be available in March of 2022? Yep, yep, correct. Fantastic. Well, good luck to you, Julia. If you decide to write another book, be it a sequel, a prequel, or something completely different, I expect you to come back and share it with us. I absolutely will. Thanks so much, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of BHP Book Club. I am your host, Kelly Morgan. I just wrapped up with author Julia Sullivan as we discussed her book, Bone Necklace. Bone Necklace is available on her website, juliasullivan.com. It's also available on Amazon. If you are an author and you are interested in being a member of the book club and promoting your book, head over to my website, brightheadedpublishing.com. Again, 
That's brightheadedpublishing.com. Go to the comments section, drop me a note, and we'll go ahead and make sure that you too are a member of the book club promoting your book. I thank everyone who listens. I could not do this without you. I am truly thankful. Thank you so much. Next week, we'll have another author. But until then, keep writing.